Those you guys who don't know me, my name is Michael Gross. I'm one of the pastors here at Quarry, and uh, I'm a little, little, little tear shed today. Uh, I'm the father of, of five uh, children. None of them are in my house. None of them are with me today. They are spread across the whole country. It's, uh, it's kind of a sad day. I'm just going to cry just by myself up here. Uh, let, me, let me start off today by praying for the group of students who are, are down in McAllen, Texas right now. Uh, probably, I think they got off their plane and go, we thought it was hot in Minnesota. Um, but they're, they're going to be serving down there, being blessed and blessing uh, through, through Friday. And then they're going to go hang out on a beach, which sounds awesome. Um, but let's pray. Uh, and, just, and we'll also invite God into our time. Um, that's, what, that's what we're here. We're here to meet with God today. So if you would, bow your heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, <clears throat> God, it's our privilege to be able to come together and to worship you. We're here to worship you, God. To hear from you. To, uh, um, to experience you afresh. And, and God, we just, in, in this moment, uh, just, just open up our hearts to whatever you have for us. And that you would speak clearly to us today, God. And Lord, we, we want to lift up uh, our brothers and sisters who are in McAllen, Texas right now. Uh, just, just give them safety, Lord. And, and I pray, Father, that you would use them in mighty ways, that you would bless them in profound ways, that it would be undeniable their experience with you in, in these coming moments, Lord. We, we praise you. We thank you. We're so grateful you're here with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, and to, to just, a, just a special thank you for those of you guys who are supporting uh, that, that mission trip. It doesn't happen uh, by wishful thinking. You guys are sacrificial, and it's pretty amazing to be a part of, of this body of people. So, so you heard um, Adam, Adam said that we are, are starting a brand new series called We Believe. In our statement of faith, the quarry outlines 11 different tenets, 11 different foundational uh, pieces that, that really out of which we, we exist. We have, we have our meaning, our, our being. This is, this is where our values come from. This is where our mission comes from. This is where our vision comes from. And ultimately, our, our strategy and ministry goals. And the, these, these statements are critical to us because they, they, they help us to focus Without these underlying beliefs, we just wander off and, and, and we don't really accomplish the mission that God has set out for us. So, so this summer, we're going to focus on those 11 tenets that we might walk in the same direction together for the glory of God. And now today, we're, we're going to discuss one of the most important questions that a follower of Jesus needs to answer. And, and before I start the message, I want to give credit where credit is due. Much of this content comes from a lecture that was given by a, a pastor, author, apologist. He's actually dean of theology at African Christian University in Zambia, and his name is, is Bodhi Bakum. Now, it's not lost on me today that it's, it's Juneteenth where we celebrate the emancipation of, of black slaves. And we are being blessed today by the thinking of a gifted, passionate, black follower of Jesus, to whom I'm thankful. <clears throat> All right, so, so what, is, what is this most important question? Now, right away, you're probably thinking, well, I mean, the most important question has to do with how I enter into a relationship with Jesus. Like, like how do I do that? And yes, that is a critical, important question. But once you answer that question, there's another question that is going to be asked. And that question is going to, ha it has to do with the authority upon which you base that first answer. And so ultimately, you're going to have to answer the question like, like, why the Bible? Because that's where we get our information from. That's where we get our understanding of Christ. That's where we get our understanding of the church. That's where we, we come to know who God is, ultimately. So, so why? Why do you choose to believe the Bible? Why, why is this our, our first declaration in our statement of faith? That, that we believe the, that the Bible is the verbally and totally inspired word of God. 
The Bible is our supreme and final authority. It is ultimate authority in faith and life. So that, that covers everything. Why the Bible above other books? Because listen, inevitably everyone has their own set of beliefs. Right? Everybody has their own set of books. And people ascribe varying degrees of authority to these books. This is, this is an important question. And you, you are right to ask it. Right? I mean, if you're here this morning and you, you wouldn't identify yourself as a follower of Jesus, you are right to ask the question, why? Why the Bible? This is foundational because every other belief that we discuss is going to hinge on the answer to this question. I mean, Christians all over the planet, they, they want an answer to this question. And I imagine that you do too. Let's just, just hypothetically say that you, you find yourself and <clears throat> you are watching a popular Netflix program. And in this program, there are a couple of characters, and they're having a discussion about faith. It's a, it's a, little, it's a little covert, right? But you catch it. You, you see that it's happening. One of the people who are having the dialogue are a Christian, and the other is an atheist. And of course, the Christian is kind of stereotyped, is, is not very intelligent, is kind of, you know, unassuming, uh, you know, and, and the atheist is, is typically very intelligent and, and cool and all put together. But the atheist asks the Christian why they live life the way they do, why they make certain decisions, why they choose to live generously or, or strive for purity in their life or, or abstain from, from different activities. And the Christian responds, well, it's because the Bible, I, I, I believe in the Bible, I believe the Bible tells me how to live, right? And it's at this point that the atheist smirks just a little bit and recaps what the Christian said. All right, so... So you, you live the way you live because the Bible says? Right? I mean, really? I mean, wh why the Bible instead of some other authority? What, what's so great about the Bible? Why, why the Bible and not the Quran or, or the Book of Mormon or the teachings of Confucius or, or some other really intelligent guy at the university, you know? So let me bring you back to that couch or that chair that you're watching in. Maybe you're on the floor. Because as you're watching that, throw, that show, you, you're, you're starting to ask that same question. I mean, why, why do I believe in the Bible over every other book? Maybe I shouldn't. And the challenge grows inside of you because most of us don't take the time to answer that question. And that unanswered question begins to erode the sand upon which you have built your faith. And so, so how would you answer that question? I mean, really, how would you answer? Why the Bible above every other book? Well, most of us, we answer in one of two ways, and neither are very compelling. I mean, the first is this. Like, like I believe in the Bible because that's the way I was raised. And we, we kind of stand on that. And friends, that, that, that's not a compelling answer. And let me, let me tell you why. Because, because people all over the world have been raised in different ways with, with, with differing beliefs. And so what makes our belief better? Because, I mean, if, if you're talking to, to a, a, a Muslim or an atheist or a Buddhist, essentially what you're getting into, if you're having a conversation with them about faith and why you believe, and that's your answer, it's essentially just a, a, a bigger, more mature version of, of my dad's better than your dad. You know, or... Or my parents raised me better than your parents raised you. See, that answer will not sustain or grow your faith over time. I mean, the second problem with that first answer is, is you were raised in a family. And as you've grown older, I mean, you, you've come to realize that your family is fallible. Right? They make mistakes. They, they tell you things that when you're growing up, you discover as you get older that they're just not true. Like, hey, hey, put a, put a hat on your head as you go outside. It's cold outside. You're going to catch cold if you don't put a hat on. And you realize that I don't, I don't get a cold through my head, right? It's, it's a virus that I breathe in. We, we all, we're very familiar with viruses these days. Right? Or, or, or your, your parents say, hey, stop making that face. You keep making that face. If you keep making that face, it's just going to stay there forever. 
And, and it's just not. It doesn't. It doesn't. And so you realize over time that your parents tell you things that are not true. You lied to me. <laughs> and you let go of so many things, but you're holding on to the Bible thing? Really? All right, the, the second most popular response to the Bible question, and, and we love this response in our day because, because today experience Experience trumps everything. Experience can't be questioned. And so we say something like, well, I tried Jesus and he, and he changed my life. I mean, just, just changed my life. And the person you're talking to just says, well, good, good for you. I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that that worked for you. Now, I, I, I believe, just I'm going to be really clear about this, that I, I, I believe that Jesus will change your life. But think about how that sounds to a skeptic. Like you tried it. You tried God. You, you, you tried living in a way outlined in your Bible and, and your life was changed. All right, so what do you mean it was changed? What do you, what do you mean? And, and how do you know? How do you know that there's a correlation between the Bible and your life change? Do you really think that you're the only person in the world who has tried something and it changed their life? Like it worked. That's, that's your answer. Let me, let me tell you about a guy who uh, was raised in the Midwest. True story, right? He's part of a, a really large family. But some, some pretty dramatic things happened in his childhood. His, his mother struggled with mental illness. His father was murdered when he was young. He ended up having to, to go to Boston to live with his older sister. And while he was there, he ran into to a crowd that was a little unseemly. But he ended up hanging around that crowd and... And he became a lot like them. Before too long, he found himself in prison in Massachusetts. And while he was in prison, a man came up to him and he said, Man, you need, you, you need, you need life change. And the answer for you is this, this Messiah figure that I, that, that, that I, I want to introduce you to. But, 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 but this man kind of pushed back a little bit. He said, No, I, I can't take that leap. I'm not going to do it, but one night in his cell, he had this personal vivid encounter with this Messiah, and overnight, his whole life was changed. I mean, like, like really changed. He became a model inmate. He ended up getting out of prison early, ended up becoming one of the most famous preachers of all time. There are, there are streets in multiple cities in our nation that are named after him. This man was responsible for opening over 100 houses of worship. His name is Malcolm X. His Messiah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, whom he later came to realize was a fraud. And so he left the nation of Islam and became an Orthodox Muslim. And the nation of Islam had him assassinated. So, so Malcolm X, he had an experience and it changed his life. But he was wrong. By the end of his life, he knew that he was wrong. So that experience that he had in that prison cell was, was fraudulent, but he based his whole life on that experience. That can't be our best answer. Now some of you are thinking, well, oh, hold on, you, you took away my two best responses. Now what do I have? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to give you something that you'll be able to walk out of here confident in and why we believe that Scripture is authoritative in our life. So I want you to go back with me to that Netflix program that you're watching. And, and this will likely never be written into a show like this. I mean, because I mean, shows that want to make money, they're not going to quite speak this way. But, but just go with me. Like, like, like the script goes something like this. When, when the question comes, well, why do you believe in the Bible? And why do you live certain ways? The Christian character responds with something like this. That I, I choose to believe in the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. That's why I believe. That, my friends, would be a show worth watching. I mean, just, just, just how they would script the reaction from the atheists, I would love to see that. And so I, I want you to, I want to teach you this response today, and, and I hope it will build your faith and give you a solid response for why you believe, why you believe that Scripture is authoritative. 
So, so if you have your Bibles, and I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles. I, w- I want you to open up with me towards the back of your Bible. We're going to look at, at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 16 and essentially go through verse 21. And that's going to be uh, the thrust of the message today. Now some of you are a little upset already because you see that we're turning to the Bible to make a case for why we would believe the Bible. And you might be thinking that you can't prove the Bible by enlisting the Bible. That's called circular reasoning. But let let me be clear. I'm not here to prove the Bible today. The goal this morning is to answer the question, why do we as Quarry Church believe the Bible? So I'm not here to prove the Bible. I'm not here to defend the Bible. I agree with Charles Spurgeon who said, I would no more defend the Bible than I would defend a lion. You don't, you don't defend a lion, you just let him loose. And he'll defend himself. So why, why do we believe the Bible? The answer to that question resides in the Bible itself. Because we believe, and we said this in our statement of faith, that there is no higher authority than the Bible. And so if I were to appeal to another authority, then I would be conceding the fact that there is a higher authority than the Bible. And so I'm making the argument that the Bible is the highest authority. And so by definition, I cannot appeal to another authority. So let's look at the Bible and see if it is worthy of this ultimate claim. 2 Peter 1, uh, starting in verse 16, just context here. Peter's responding to questions about the authority of Scripture. This is nothing new. He writes, For we did not follow cleverly concocted fables when we made known to you the power and return of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, we were eyewitnesses of his grandeur. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory This is my dear son in whom I am delighted. When this voice was conveyed from heaven, we ourselves heard it. For we were with him on the holy mountain. Moreover, we possess the prophetic word as an altogether reliable thing. You do well if you pay attention to this. And you would, as you would, to a light shining in a murky place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you do well if you recognize this. No prophecy of Scripture ever comes about by the prophet's own imagination. For no prophecy was ever born of human impulse. Rather, men carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So this, this, is, this is Peter's response to questions about the authority of Scripture. And it's from this response that, that, that Vodi Bakum created this why believe statement. And so I want to spend the rest of the time we have together breaking this statement down, phrase by phrase, word by word, because every word has meaning in this, has importance. And so the statement starts out that the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. I want you to say that with me. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. Let's say that one more time. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. Now, each, each, of those, each of those words carries meaning, and we're going to kind of break that out as we continue, right? That the Bible is reliable. The Bible is historical. The Bible, the Bible is a collection. I mean, unlike many other holy books, the Bible is a collection of multiple different documents. There's not one primary individual who says that he heard from God and everybody else has to now listen to him. The Bible was written by 40 plus different authors who, who most of them never met one another from multiple walks of life. They were, they were kings and generals fishermen and and tax collectors, historians, doctors, this diverse population of people. The Bible was written on three different continents, on Asia, Africa, Europe. The Bible was written in three different languages, mainly Hebrew and Greek, a little bit of Aramaic sprinkled in there. And these these authors, these 40-plus authors, they produced 66 Different volumes covering hundreds of topics written over a period of more than 1,500 years. I, just, I want you to let that sink in a little bit. Three continents, 
three languages, 40 plus authors, hundreds of subjects written over a period of 1,500 years that come together as a cohesive whole. So this is a reliable collection of historical documents. This is not simply an individual making a claim. And the, the fact that it's a reliable collection of historical documents, it, it adds to the credibility of Scripture. And so we take that and, and we, we place that over here and we hold on to it. L listen to this. This is from Luke's Gospel. Luke, he was a physician, a historian, and he starts off his gospel in this way. He says, Now many have undertaken to compile an account of the things that have been filled among us, like the accounts passed on to us by those who were, what? Who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word from the beginning. So it seemed good to me as well, because I have followed all things carefully from the beginning, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may be confused. No. So that you may know for certain the things you were taught. See, here's, what, here's what's interesting about Luke, right? He's not an eyewitness. He doesn't claim to be an eyewitness. He says he's a, he's a, he's a historian who, who has traced the information from multiple eyewitnesses. And he wrote it down so that you might know. Now, now some people, they, they push back. They say, okay, you guys, there, there are four Gospels. Why four Gospels? I mean, really, wouldn't one be enough? Doesn't this create a problem that there are four Gospels? Well, it depends on the purpose of those writings. See, all the Gospels tell the same story, the story of Jesus. But they tell from different perspectives and they have, they have different intention. Right? Luke's goal is history and chronology. He wanted to give the story in the right order. This is how it was, right? Now, now John... John wrote the gospel by his same name. He's very upfront in saying, this is all about evangelism. I want people to know. I, I'm writing this that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Mark, Mark's gospel is different. Mark, Mark was about, about, about being concise, about being precise. Nothing but the facts. And then you have Matthew. Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience and he wants to demonstrate that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah. And he, so he starts out, Right? With, with, with this genealogy that all of you have memorized. You can barely get through it, right? But it's there for a purpose. Uh, understand, we have a reliable collection. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. And Luke is saying in no uncertain terms that these are historical documents. Back to what, what, what Peter said. He says, we did not follow cleverly concocted fables when we made known to you the power and return of our Lord Jesus Christ. These weren't a collection of myths. These are facts. And notice the next phrase. We, we, we say that we were, uh, Peter says that we were eyewitnesses. We add this to our, to our I believe statement. That the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. All right, let's say this whole thing together again. Ready? The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. All right, turn with me to 1 John. The 1 John. Very back of your Bible. Now notice, 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 notice the words that John chooses. This is, this is 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. He says, This is what we proclaim to you, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and our hands have touched concerning the word of life and the life was revealed and we have seen and testify and announced to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you. So that you may have fellowship with us. So, so we, have, we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. The author is claiming, proclaiming, that we were the eyewitnesses to those events. These weren't people who, who heard it from a friend, who heard it from a friend, who heard it from a... No, they, it was them. They did this. They, they were the eyewitnesses. 
And it's true for both the Old and the New Testaments. The authors were the people who saw and wrote about these events. And so we have reliable, a reliable collection of historical documents, and that's, that's really good. But we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses, and that makes it even better. But we're not done yet. Because they were written during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. All right, so let's, let's say this one together, right? Let's do this together, right? The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. Now, there are some challenges to this claim, right? People want to argue about it. They, they, want, to, they want to claim a late date to the Bible, right? So, so, so that, that the Bible is written outside the lifetime of those eyewitnesses. But turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. This is Paul's letter to the first letter to the church in Corinth. And he, he writes this. This is verse, verse 1 of, of chapter 15. He says, Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preached to you, that you received, on which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he, here's some eyewitnesses, and he names them, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the, all, the, all the apostles. Last of all, as though to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy of being called an apostle. All right, so, so if you do just do simple math, right, and you're generous, you're conservative here, there are at least 263 eyewitnesses to the resurrection that were alive when that letter Paul's letter to the church in Corinth was written. At least 263 witnesses still alive. Alive to corroborate or contradict the account. This is really important. There's so much evidence here. Did you know, did you know, just a side note, did you know that there have been over 25,000 archaeological digs related directly to the subject matter of the Bible? 25,000 archaeological digs. And not one of them has contradicted anything that was written in the Bible. The overwhelming majority have confirmed and affirmed the information that we find in Scripture but this, this shouldn't surprise us because when we look at the internal evidence within the pages of what we call the Bible, that evidence is compelling. At least 263 witnesses were still alive when Paul wrote. This is important because it means that the gospel message of the Bible was falsifiable. Right? And, and this is important when you're testing the veracity of, of a claim, of a historical claim. Because if it's not falsifiable... If there's not someone who can tell me it's true or false, then, then I'm just relying on somebody's word. Like, I said this happened and you should believe me. But when Paul wrote the claim about Jesus' death and resurrection, there were at least 263 people who could falsify the claim and say, no, that didn't happen. It didn't happen that way. Not at all. But listen, no, nobody did. Nobody falsified it. Nobody contradicted the claim. Now, I, I get it. That alone doesn't prove it's truthfulness, but it's another piece of evidence that we, we put over here, and they start to pile up. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other witnesses. But, but there's a problem here, and the problem is that we are all uh, well-educated people, or we, we think we're pretty well-educated, maybe even over-educated. We live in this stream of information and misinformation We believe we know stuff about this claim, that we have a, a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. But maybe that's not true. I mean, because the stuff, I, I think I heard this, right, that the stuff was written later, right? There's a late date to the Bible, that the Bible's written later than within the lifetime of eyewitnesses have you guys heard that argument? Anyone here heard that argument? Hands in the air, have you heard that argument? Well, let me tell you about this argument. <laughs> I 
wasn't there a guy named Constantine? And wasn't he kind of a powerful dude? And, and didn't, he, didn't he, I don't know, change some things? And add some stuff, took some other stuff away? Let, let, let's test this idea that the Bible was written later than within the lifetime of eyewitnesses. See, because when we say that the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, we are making the claim for an early date. We are, we are presupposing that the collection of documents that comprise the New Testament were written within the lifetime of eyewitnesses to the events of the New Testament. We are claiming that the New Testament was composed by the end of the first century. And now there, there are some who will argue against this idea on a couple of different fronts. I mean, they might say that the Bible's not reliable because, I mean, it's been translated so many different times. I mean, people to people to people. And, and over, over time, that, that, the translation, it, it just, there, there, there becomes issues with that. We lose things. We gain things. So maybe what we have, I mean, it was true when it was originally written, but we don't have the truth anymore. It's been changed over time through translation. That's the critique. Now, hear, hear me. I'm not trying to be mean. Really, I, I, I just I want to be frank with you. The people who propagate this type of nonsense are either evil, ignorant, or both. And, and let me explain to you why. See, what they believe is that the Bible has been translated kind of like the game of telephone. You guys know the game of telephone, right? Like I, I say something to somebody and, and they whisper to the next person's ear and then that person whispers to the next person's ear and that person whispers to the next person's ear and, and you, you get all the way down the line, right? And then and finally the last person who received the message talks to the first person who received the message and they talk about what they, what they heard and they're two totally different things, right? It's kind of fun. But the argument is that we can't trust the Bible because the translation process is similar to that of the game of telephone. But this is the problem. Because there are people who, who claim to be intelligent who continue to make this argument. And there are Christians who listen to this argument and are just dumbfounded. They don't know what to do with it at best. And they're stripped of their faith at worst. See, here's the problem. Think about this with me. If I'm the Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic manuscript, right? I mean, how it went down... Right? I, I don't just whisper into one person's ear and then that person whispers into one person's ear. So some, some of you guys know that the, the scripture we use typically on a Sunday is the New English translation. It's, it's really my favorite translation of scripture. I use it to study. It's got all types of, of helpful information. It was first published in 2001 and it's been revised since that time four different, four different times. But when producing this Bible, the translators didn't just look to the most recently translated Bible. It's not like they went to the NRSV or the NIV and they translated from that. No, they went all the way back to the original manuscripts written in the original languages of Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Which means that the translation game actually goes like this. Like if I'm the manuscript, like, like I'll tell to you. Right, and then I'll tell to you, 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 and I'll tell to you. Right? And, and, and so when the last person I told as a manuscript comes to the first person that was told about the manuscript, there's no difference in what they heard because they heard from the original source. They both heard from the same source. And so that's why those who use this argument, this telephone game argument, are ignorant, evil, like, like they're doing this on purpose, or they're both. How, how can any intelligent person argue against the validity of the Bible because of the number of times it was translated? Listen, for the person who is willing to learn Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, you could go back to the source yourself. Those, those sources are available. Translations can be tested. There's software available now that will allow you to test current translations against those original manuscripts. There's no hiding here. It's all in the open. Okay, okay, great, great. All right, all right. Well, I'm not done. Like the documents we have today, they're, they're late documents, right? And, and we don't know what the original document said. All right, let's, let's look just for a moment at the documents themselves, the manuscripts themselves. Because there are some issues that we need to address. Because when it comes to the Bible, it is true that we don't have the original, the original documents. Largely because the materials that they were written on, they just decay over time. But we do have 
And I'm speaking now about the New Testament. We do have manuscripts that date to as early as 100 AD, right? The events of the Bible took place, right, between 30 and, and 80, 90 AD. So that's within a couple of decades within the completion of the New Testament. How, how, many, manuscripts, how many manuscripts do we have? We have, we have over 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts uh, about the New Testament. Over, over 6,000. We can go back to the... We can go back within, within, within two decades of the events occurring during the New Testament. And now, now I get it. Uh, for some of you, that doesn't sound very compelling. It's like, so, so what? And it's probably because we don't spend a bunch of time studying ancient writings. But let me give you an example. T- take the writings of Aristotle. A lot of you have heard who Aristotle is. And we have his writings. And we claim that they're true. And we go after them. We have less than a dozen copies of Aristotle's poetics. And the earliest ones we have are at least a thousand years after it was originally written. Take Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. Again, less than a dozen manuscripts, a thousand years between when it was written and the the first manuscript that we have. The best example we have when we talk about the number of manuscripts is Homer's Iliad. We have over a hundred manuscripts of Homer's Iliad. But the earliest one we have dates to 2,100 years after the original was written. And so, so think about this. Put this all in context, right? People have the audacity to question the validity of the New Testament, which is ridiculous. I mean, if this, if this were a fight between the two, the referees, they, w- they, they would stop it. They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even let it happen. See, if the Bible is not considered reliable in the academy our institutions of higher learning, then there is no ancient document that should ever be considered trustworthy because none of them come even close to the Bible. So we believe the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. All right, so, so right now what we have is a good history book. That's cool. But here's where it gets rich. Verse 17, Peter writes, for, for he received honor, Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory. This is my dear son in whom I am delighted. When this voice was conveyed from heaven, we ourselves heard it for we were with him on the holy mountain. Hmm. So now we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events. All right, just to make sure you guys are awake, say this with me. All right? The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They reported supernatural events. So, so we're talking here about supernatural events, not, not superhuman events. Right? Those are like sports highlights, man. That, that, that stuff is pretty common. But these are supernatural events. Peter is writing here about the Mount of Transfiguration, right? When Jesus goes up on the mountain with, with a couple of his followers and he's supernaturally changed on that mountain. When, and, and he visits with Moses and Elijah. It's a crazy little piece of scripture. And so the Bible is not just a bunch of rules about religion. It's a, it's a collection of supernatural events. These authors claim that Jesus, he healed the sick. He, he defied natural laws by, by doing things like walking on the water and, and the big one, Right? The big one, where he was dead on Friday. Sunday, tomb is empty. He's risen. He's visiting friends. He's restoring hope. These are not just the writings of a religious community trying to pass down rules and regulations. This book contains the story of Israel as they cross the Red Sea on dry ground, of Abraham who's, who's given a vision of becoming a great nation for the glory of God, of God speaking into nothing and creating all that we know. This is a supernatural book written about supernatural things. That's what the Bible claims to be. And not not only are these supernatural events, they are supernatural events that took place in the fulfillment of specific prophecy. All right, this is where it gets kind of weird for some of us. Right, but I, I want to be clear, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about general Nostradamus-type prophecies. 
We're not, we're not talking about like faith healer type of prophecies. Like, like it doesn't take me, you know, a, a whole lot of uh, a, a prophetic prowess to say to a group like this, you know, I, I think there's somebody in the crowd today who's got back issues. You know, I mean, you all got back issues, you know, or, or I, you know, I, in a crowd like this, I, I think there's somebody today who's struggling with their job. And so that, that's not the kind of prophecy that we're talking about here. I'm talking about, for example, the prophecy found in Isaiah 53. Over 700 years before Jesus was born, get this, Isaiah prophesied that that Jesus would be born and he'd be born the suffering servant. This is a a powerful passage, Isaiah 53. On on your own time, go read it. There's, there's There's a group in Israel called One for Israel and they use this passage. They do outreach to, to Jewish people in Israel. I mean, anybody they can talk to, anybody who will talk to them. And one of the things they do is called the Isaiah 53 Project. When they are talking with Jewish people, they'll, they'll ask them a question. They'll, they'll say, I'm going to read something to you, and I want you to tell me uh, who you think it's about and where you think we find this particular reading. And so they read Isaiah 53. And the typical response is, oh, that's a story about Jesus. And that comes from your New Testament, doesn't it? But when they discover that the text is actually from the Old Testament, from, from the original Hebrew text, they are visibly shaken because they realize that the life and death of Jesus was in fulfillment of prophecy. See, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies. Verse 19, moreover, we possess the prophetic word as an altogether reliable thing. You do well if you pay attention to this as you would to a light shining in a murky place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Understand what Peter is saying here. He's proclaiming that that, that the prophecies, they, they might not save you, right? You're saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. But maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, I can't, I can't quite make that jump. I'm not, I'm not sure I, I, can, I can make that, that leap to belief. Okay, okay, but pay, but pay attention to the light that you see. Pay, pay attention to what you're hearing. Pay attention to that light that's shining in a murky place. Because you're like, you're like a person who's out at night who sees a lamp shining in the distance. Did, did you know that the human eye can see a lamp, a burning lamp for over a mile? in the dark. And what do you do when you see that burning light and you're out there by yourself? You've watched that burning light. And you see, is it coming closer? Is it coming closer? Is it getting, is it getting brighter? I want you to watch. You watch. You watch and you see if that light is moving closer. Listen, if you're at a place where you don't yet believe, Peter tells you to watch. You watch until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart because that's what you need. You need the day to dawn. You need the sun to come up. You need that morning star, Jesus himself, to rise up in your being, in your heart. You need to be made alive by him. But for now, you watch. You watch. You you read. You study. You seek truth. You You don't settle for unknown. You don't take your eyes off of that light. Verse 20. Above all, you do well if you recognize this, that no prophecy of Scripture ever comes about by the prophet's own imagination. For no prophecy was ever born of human impulse. Rather, men carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So so the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claimed that their writings were of divine rather than human origin. The authors of Scripture make the claim that they received a word from God. Over and over, this is what we read. And and the Lord said... Thus saith the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Moses, and the Lord spoke to so-and-so. These authors are claiming that these are God's words, not man's words. And by the way, when, when these prophecies are fulfilled, it gives credence to that proclamation. Isn't that, isn't that right? 
So, so last, last challenge, and then we're, we'll wrap up. In the circles that I have lived, I, I've heard this deviant critique more often than I care to remember. That, that I can't quite make that leap of faith because I'm a person of, of science. Right? And unless you can prove scientifically the claims of the Bible, then I, then I simply cannot believe. And honestly, when, when people say that, I just want to come up and give them a hug. I don't want to say, just, I mean, really? Really? Be, because they, they believe that they are so super intelligent, but their words are betraying their ignorance. I, I, want to, I just want to put my arms around them and say, hey, hey, listen, 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 listen. What you just said, you know about science? Don't ever say that aloud again. Because it, it makes you sound super unintelligent. And they're like, what? what, 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 what they're, you know, they're, they're offended in that moment. But really, I, I, just, I just want to help. I mean, come on. Don't, 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 don't you understand the scientific method? Do you know the scientific method? Do you know what it means? That whatever you're studying has to be observable, repeatable, and measurable. That's the scientific method. And history, by definition... It's not observable. It already happened. It happened in the past. It's not repeatable. It already happened. It happened in the past. It's not measurable. You can't measure it. You don't use the scientific method to prove the historical events. And so when you say that you need scientific evidence in order to believe, you sound unintelligent. You don't use the scientific method to prove historical events. You use the evidentiary method. This is what you use in a courtroom. I mean, what do you do? You, you ask about reliability of sources. You ask about the corroboration of those sources. You ask about the internal and external sources that support those claims. These are the kinds of questions that you ask. Like, like who are the witnesses? Are they reliable? Are they, are they trustworthy witnesses? Are the assertions falsifiable? Are there other things contradicting this or confirming the claims? These are the types of questions that you ask in the evidentiary method. And when you ask those types of questions of the Bible, you come up with answers like three continents, three languages, 40 different authors, most of whom never met one another, 66 volumes addressing hundreds of different topics that come together in this cohesive unit that tells one redemptive story over a period, written over a period of 1,500 years. And therefore, you have reliability. You have 25,000 archaeological digs pertaining directly to matters discussed in the Bible that confirm the writings. You have external contemporaries that confirm what is written in the text. Therefore, the intelligent person is not the one who says, I simply can't believe. That's the fool. The intelligent person says, I, I choose to believe the Bible because... It's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. Amen? And if that's not enough, just tell them to try. Jesus changed my life. That's my story. And I believe he will change yours.